welcome everyone to Fa seminar once again. Uh, we will have maybe one or two more people trickle in, um, but they'll only miss the not so important part, which is uh, me rambling for a few seconds. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming and special thanks to Joel. Uh, Joel has a very interesting bio and um, his PhD in computer science. Uh, that may be the, the least interesting part or at least dis distinguishing from other guests that we've had, but um, has then been a founding member of Uber AI Labs, if I'm not mistaken. Really? And has, has led a team at, at OpenAI as well, um, and has written a book, um, and I think it's called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so a very interesting title, and I've I listened to a couple of podcasts about it, so it seems like an interesting book as well. I've yet to read it, but uh, there's a recommendation for everyone. Um, and yeah, here today to talk to us um, about recommender systems for human flourishing and growth is Joel. So let's give him a warm welcome. Hello, good morning. Um, Thank you for that introduction. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk today about um, work in progress. The ideas are a little um, uh, preliminary. So if I lose you, which I may, I invite you to interrupt me, uh, ask questions during rather than later. Um, I'm a bit nervous because uh, these ideas are still coming to uh, fruition in my mind, and so they might come off as a bit naive. Um, but that said, I'm, I'm going to um, do my best to to, to talk about human flourishing. So um, who am I? Uh, my name's Joel. Um, I'm, I've been doing machine learning research for a while, so I'm probably, I wonder if I'm the oldest person in the room. I'm 39, about to turn 40, um, probably. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and I used to work with uh, neural networks that uh, were about 10 neurons. We've, we've kind of come a, a far away. Uh, it's a little bit strange for the field to have changed so much during it. Um, I was basically, I was, I was an academic for a while um, and then got kind of sucked into Silicon Valley through this um, this startup led by Gary Marcus, kind of. Um, you heard of it called Geometric Intelligence, which led to me kind of going to uh, Uber. And for, for a time, there was, a, there was an AI safety research lab within Uber AI that I led, a very small one. Um, uh, then I more recently led a, a co-led a team at OpenAI. So I'm interested in a lot of themes in machine learning um, and be happy to talk to you about any of them um, after afterwards. Um, mainly, my research has been something called open-endedness, which is about how you create algorithms that kind of prolifically create endlessly, kind of inspired by biological evolution or the process of the science. Um, but more recently, I've been interested in AI safety, um, and it's hard to ignore language models, so I've gotten that as well. Um, I've been trying to uh, pivot my research more from open-endedness without a safety focus, um, you could say, to something with more of a safety focus. And my preliminary thinking is something, the intersection of, of AI and human flourishing. Um, okay, so I want to give like, a big picture of what I'll talk about before I dive into um, some of the details. Um, so the kind of scenarios that I'm interested in is scenarios that are similar to where we presently are. So we maybe right now we have AI that's kind of pretty, you know, pretty capable, kind of powerful, probably a little bit more powerful, but for the midterm, um, you know, or at least the short term, it's not super intelligent. And it's deployed through you know, corporate AIs and open source models. And there's lots of these models being used in different contexts. So it's not just one monolithic model that um, is sort of godlike in nature, but lots of tiny models um, or smaller models that maybe are equivalent to you know, people, if not super, super human. So in this world that we presently are living in, we get lots more optimization power, um, but it's largely deployed through things that kind of look like our current institutions, markets, politics, government, science. And we, in this picture, I might assume, um, and this is not necessarily true, but maybe it's useful to assume so sometimes um, just to, um, to grant some resources to possible worlds. Uh, maybe there's some years long delay before super intelligence, um, imagining like the current paradigm hits a wall, which is certainly happened before in AI, but it may not. So in this world, um, it seems to me like that, that the kind of existing misalignment that we have in society, um, institutions, um, and actually misalignment unto ourselves, that we don't always act in our best interests, is enough to wreck things or at least us, you know, make things kind of not great. Um, uh, so like the, 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 the kind of synopsis would be maybe humans um, were not impervious to reward hacking and we kind of get hacked by markets and politicians. And overall, we start making very unwise social decisions that maybe lead to extinction of dystopia. So not, nothing with like an AI takeover, but another way that AI can make things go, go bad. Um, and so from that point of view, maybe it'd be nice if we had some idea of like, what is it we're actually trying to do? And 
uh, this work takes inspiration from uh, people that study human flourishing, which would be kind of a multidisciplinary disciplinary effort, um, philosophers and psychologists, um, and that, that kind of flavor, economists, some, some economists as well. And the question would be like, how can AI help us to optimize for humanity's collective flourishing in this kind of world? Um, and I'll, I'll tackle the full problem here, but um, the second part of my talk will focus on like a smaller sub problem in a micro domain uh, as I'm trying to get kind of my footing. Um, and so basically what I'll be talking about in that section is how can we move towards recommender systems, not talking about the full solution, but just like a recommended system that is aligned with facets of human flourishing because recommender systems are just one kind of technical system that have a lot of societal impact on us from things like social media um, to kind of YouTube and all these kinds of other systems that are basically more and more taking up of, uh, our mind space. So this will be a talk in two parts. The first talk will be more philosophical, just talking about flourishing, why it's interesting, why it's important, um, and what alignment means um, in kind of like a socio-technological kind of perspective. Um, and then the second part of the talk will be more, you could say, grounded or focused or narrow on um, recommended recommender systems and with a particular micro domain that I just kind of like, which is kind of book recommendations. Okay, so um, the you know question that humans have been trying to answer for millennia is you know what is human flourishing? What does it mean for us to, to do well um, for ourselves? Um, and you know we can kind of paint this like you know this rough integral of of all humans across you know some long time horizon that we want all humans to do well um, by their reward function, whatever that might be, um, which is conditioned complicatedly on their own history, every person's history, the other humans around them, the environment, all those things impact kind of like what you think is um, is a good life. Um, so when I talk about this human reward function, I don't um, mean just like the pleasure signals. I mean, like all things considered, what makes for a good life for you? Um, and so we don't know. Um, there's a lot of you know conflicting ideas that have people have. You might have ideas about this. Um, you know, we could roughly point to something that comes from the positive psychology liter literature called PERMA, just one model by this guy, Martin Seligman, which is that maybe some of the rough ingredients of flourishing are things like positive emotions, uh, engagement, which he kind of uh, makes similar to the idea of flow states, uh, are positive relationships, um, M is meaning or like a purpose in life, and A is achievement. So, you know, probably in our own lives, we can at least connect with some of these dimensions that we, we want that. Um, but how that actually manifests, what you find meaningful, what you find engaging, really depends on your environment. Um, so it's, it's a weird kind of reward function. It's very flexible. There's no real ground truth to it because it depends on all these little different aspects of society, like how you were educated, what kind of worldview you happen to have, the kind of media you were exposed, your family environment, and what was privileged or not privileged, or um, you know, uh, in the social environment, and so on, and media that you encounter. Um, all this kind of seeps into our bones and influences what we what causes us, what situations will cause us to kind of flourish by our own lights. So it's kind of a weird situation. But it's, it's complicated integral. Um, and ideally, as a society, we're trying to optimize over really long time scales. So not just momentary, not just maybe even over our own lifetime, but over successive generations. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in this equation that we don't even know the reward function that we're trying, that each of us is trying to optimize, um, let alone generalizing it to all humans. And Part of this integral involves the exploration of, of trying to understand what it is we're even trying to do and that we need to balance that exploration with making lives, people's lives okay right now and also trying to balance it without destroying ourselves or going extinct or finding some kind of apocalyptic um, uh, end, whether it's like totalitarianism or actual extinction. And so like a lot of overlap in that kind of safety element for, for like AI safety and kinds of things that the existential risk community in general kind of studies. So th the basic message is like, this is, I think what our, what our North Star kind of is, but it's really, it's a really tough optimization problem. Um, it's a little hard. So human society, um, one thing that we attempt to do as a species is try to optimize for this. And to do so, um, one thing we've created, um, is uh, what you call institutions, things like government, science, education, news, uh, the military, uh, a market economy, the, the public square where we discuss ideas. And that many of these institutions, you could say, are aimed at, at aligning us, actually. That um, because our reward function is so flexible, um, we need constraints. We need to be channeled in some ways. And so 
generally, societally speaking, we often like, if it was possible to influence individuals in some ways so that maximizing their idea of flourishing will also demonstrate positive externalities and everyone else will kind of also be able to flourish concurrently. Um, so our worldview, morality, what we find meaningly, meaningful are influenced by these institutions. Like our education has a, a big impact on us and um, it's kind of obvious, but it's probably better for humans to be taught something about pro-social values than to be raised by wolves. Like in terms of like how actually we, we, we end up in a society we wanna live in. Um, and so one way you could look at these institutions is that they're, they're kind of these helper um, functions or helper agents that are helping to um, uh, guide us and hopefully we, as a society, hopefully refine them over time uh, so that they can improve and uh, a deal that would kind of paint a cohesive whole together. Um, and what I mean is that um, the purpose of these institutions often complement each other. So education um, ideally would prepare us for civic involvement. So like if we, if we want to have a society that's democratic, for example, um, ideally education would prepare us to, to, to vote, uh, to have to know the value of voting, how to think critically about political arguments. Um, education also hopefully helps us to contribute to the economy, uh, maybe teaches us how to be happy. Uh, news would kind of complement that and help us help keep us well informed so that we would be able to hold politicians to account um, and we can make live wi make wise life decisions for ourselves. And you can kind of go through these different institutions and, and kind of paint a picture of how they all kind of ideally would come together um, to structure society to influence us so that we're kind of on this upward progressive path. And um, so that's the, maybe the, the dream. Um, but in practice, it seems like it doesn't kind of always work out that way. Um, and that um, misalignment of institutions of, of ourselves isn't really something new. It's not just specific to AI. Um, it's, it's kind of a general problem that we've been struggling with for as long as humans have been around. Um, so one claim you could make is that it's actually the generator function of existential risk from AI, it's not really, in some ways you could say it's intrinsic to AI itself, but in some ways it's not. That human misalignment is what generates this in the sense that we are not evolved to be equipped to deal with this kind of scenario, um, to think about AI, to think about existential risk from AI, because we didn't evolve for that. Our ancestral environment was very, very different from the, the world that we've created. So individual humans and our institutions that humans have designed, really they're not perfectly fit for this, this world that we've created. Um, and we actually could use some of the concepts from AI safety to describe the problem, which is that humans and institutions like AI are often not robust to distribution shift. That this world that we've created, we've shifted the distribution from the ancestral environment that humans kind of were well fit for to this modern world where, which is much, much different. And so our, our kind of our intuitions and our impulses often don't kind of cash out in flourishing as they might've in that environment. And similarly, humans and institutions are, we're amenable to reward hacking um, in the sense that um, humans have designed super stimuli that satisfy human desires in new ways that often don't have the same purpose behind them. So for example, and some of this could be good, some could be bad, but um, uh, that more people die from diseases of, of affluence than of starvation, for example. That there's something misaligned about if our impulse to eat uh, fatty food um, for, for high energy no longer fits our environment. There's, there's something that's kind of gone astray there, or like the way that um, if you take basically any human desire, there's some kind of economic force operating against it um, that's kind of trying to hack it. And again, this isn't always bad. Um, sometimes it actually, we, we can transcend some of the negative parts of our evolved history through this, but um, that we are hackable and that sometimes that does go astray. Okay, um, any questions at this point before I go any further? I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of big picture philosophizing it hopefully kind of makes some sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm like with you with the analogy of reward yeah. hacking and the distribution shift from the ancestral environment. Yeah. And also claiming that there wasn't like principal agent problems in the ancestral environment. Oh, um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I'm not, I don't know what the social dynamics were and how evolution tracked or didn't track them. Um, I, I would imagine there, there probably still could be principal Asian problems, but probably like less severe when you have, you know, huge bureaucracies now and, and, and things become quite different. It's a good question though. So the analogy might not, might not be perfect. Uh, any other questions before I go on? Yeah. So very quickly, because uh, Adam got us on the chat, and if you have a question, yeah, let that mic roll around. There's a second mic the mic as well. I think you said something like uh, that a lot of human institutions are aimed at um, kind of long-term flourish flourishing. And I was kind of wondering if there's a distinction in your mind and if it matters between an uh, institution that is designed explicitly kind of top-down with in mind kind of long-term human flourishing versus one that kind of in some way arises kind of naturally and then maybe kind of through social evolution is kind of reinforced and so gives rise to like longer term human flourishing. Yeah, can you get an example of, of that, the, what kind of institution you have in mind then? Um, no, uh <laughs> not off the top of my head, but it, I, yeah, I'm just yeah. kind of wondering, it seems to me like there might be a distinction between those two, but maybe also, maybe it doesn't matter, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I guess what I think of there is that, um, yeah, there could be selection for, you know, groups and ways of practice that are, it's not explicitly designed for something, but we follow the gradient because it's basically good for us in some some way, um, like communal gatherings or something like that. There's not like, at the time that they were developed, it wasn't that there's some overarching purpose yeah, yeah. to them. Um, I think, I guess I'm not making a strong distinction between those two, um, but it seems like maybe the distinction I would make is that maybe we need to get more deliberate in the future about how we think about those and whether they still align. Thank you. Does it matter sort of what scale the human? So, are you talking about when you talk about institutions for human flourishing? Are you talking about humanity as a whole, or is it just the body of people that tend to make up that institution? And does that distinction matter? Um, I guess I'm, I tend to be an idealist, I guess, and so my view would be that ideally humanity as a whole is moving in this direction. It's, it's definitely true that not all institutions are aligned with like a flourishing of all humanity, probably one line is like nations against nations or something. And ideally we can, you know, my, my idealistic mind, you know, extend this to all sentient beings or something um, as the kind of ultimate aim. And I think you could say that maybe there is some arc for human ideas towards that, but um, certainly not all institutions explicitly have that aim. Many will in effect act against, will be very um, antagonistic. Humans were Aligned before the modern world, so is that like a military type? Um, that's a good question. No, I think there's complexity there. Um, I I would I would say that things were different. Um, in the ancestral environment, at least in the sense that we didn't have the ability to reward back ourselves to the same degree. Like we didn't have the understanding of human psychology. We didn't have um teams of humans against other humans. Um. But it's probably certainly the case that, like, evolution doesn't intrinsically care about our well being. Um, it, it's kind of like a device it uses to get us to replicate. And it may be that the social structures we also evolved, we were, we were within, weren't perfectly aligned either then. Um, so maybe that's a good point. So maybe one of the distinction is just that we're in a different era when we have just access to a lot more optimization power and we can aim it more dramatically um, at kind of like trying to, to reward hack a human or for institutions to kind of hack each other. Okay, um, so it's kind of like a, a, a cheeky thought experiment is um, just to kind of point that AI existential risk is not maybe intrinsic to AI itself. We could imagine an alternate kind of Amish universe where for whatever reason, we took on a, a much different trajectory um, where there's a really incredibly mimetically strong religion that, that, that convinces us to take on technologies very slowly. And in that kind of world, um, because we have a strong culture of incremental adoption, and skepticism of technology, this wouldn't be as big of a problem as it is today. So a lot of it is, is kind of a social problem that we just are not well equipped to deal with a technology that is profitable, but also could kill us. Um, it seems hard for us. Um, so the human mind evolved to handle more concrete, localized, near-term, certain situations. Um, but the modern world is not like that. And 
we live in a world where our cell phone is trying to, you know, take up our attention all, all time of the day. And there's all these sort of abstract, long-term, globalized, uncertain situations, um, which are really confusing. Like, I don't know, you know, like, like even giving this talk today, the way that it can impact you and you could talk to someone in Japan tomorrow and like the, the kind of branching uh, space of possibilities, it just makes it less, it's less easy to think about what consequences will actually arrive from, from our actions. And uh, it's hard for us our limited human minds evolve for a different context to generalize in that way. Although we try our best, you know, people in this room definitely we're trying to do what we can, which is hard. Um, and so from this view, um, we could say that like misaligned AGI is already here. This is not a new argument, something like I think Ted Chiang and, and others have kind of like pointed towards that um, when we have something like an economy uh, with companies that have in some sense a self-interested profit motive, then um, there's a, there's an argument that they often will, um, when it's convenient, externalize harms and internalize profits. Um, so like Facebook is like an interesting te technology, it does a lot of good things for us maybe, but also some part of it is that it's kind of like taking our attention as a resource and if it distorts our epistemic compact, our epistemic commons or has weird political effects, that's just you know not part of their business model. Um, so in general, we have these big institutions um, they tend to kind of adapt kind of slowly and not always in really principled ways. And they may become more unaligned over time if like our optimization power uh, outpaces our, our sanity and ability to kind of improve and fix institutions. Um, it's like one of my pet peeves is like, you know, we, we, have, we have a lot of knowledge, but we don't actually translate that in practice because a lot of translation of knowledge into practice is like a political problem. And I just really hate the first pass the, po po the post voting system in the electoral college. I feel like it's crazy. Um, but it's just not something that there's a lot of willpower to change. And so even though we've had this knowledge of like how to make better voting systems and you know, make democracy a little bit better, like we don't actually do it. And there's like lots of examples of this and there could be, you know, counter arguments to this particular example, but uh, I don't like it. Um, okay, um, so we're gonna we're slowly nearing the end of this kind of more theoretical part of the talk. Um, and then I'll try to land the ship somehow. Uh, so, Sometimes we think of alignment as this kind of like end goal of AI, like training an AI and you're, at the end of the training, somehow you've aligned it and that's like good and done. Um, another perspective is that the way that society tends to align is more as kind of like an open-ended process that we're um, trying to find better ways of channeling human motivation and potential um, to help us survive and thrive. Um, and that we, all the endeavors within politics, the economy, science, these are all supporting things that we're trying to do that hopefully will self-improve and adapt all these institutions towards increasing flourishing. So, you know, we might progress by research into what flourishing is um, and hopefully translate into practice through activism. Um, there's also like institutional theory in practice, you know, fields like political science or economics try to figure out how we can make better political systems or economies. And then we do like practical experiments. Um, so, People try different educational structures or, or different governance or voting systems. Um, and ideally, we might have something like laboratories of democracy where we try things on a small scale and, and scale up the things that work and have correctives in general that are effective to misaligned institutions. Um, you know, ideally, like new laws that regulate things um, to remove, for example, negative market externalities and become a big problem. Um, so that's like the kind of progressive force. There's also kind of this decohering force of um, that institutions often have incentives to hack people and other institutions. So regulatory capture, addictive products. It's, um, we can just view these as, as basically like slightly misaligned agents. Um, and also uh, in Silicon Valley, people often talk about disruption, which is like an interesting word. Um, and there could be good sides to disruption and bad sides. But one possibility is, um, which seems to happen sometimes, is disruption of something that served a coherent purpose with something that's less coherent. So I keep coming back to social media because I think it's kind of the best example of this in general, but um, social media, you know, sorts of kind of like starts to impinge upon news as well. And it, it's like kind of this messy mixture of news and and kind of connecting friends and groups together. Um, and so news has a kind of a function of, of hopefully getting us more truth about the world or at least um, keeping us more well-informed. But if you replace that with this messy mixture, you get things like viral conspiracies and influencers, and you kind of lose both the function of news and a lot of the in-person connection that we we once had. Um, and so maybe we still haven't figured out how to, 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 to um, create a, a good social media. 
And so the, the, the kind of the, the driving question then, then that it's the big question that I only answer in very small part is um, if we create something like an institutional AI um, that would embody some coherent social role that's aligned with flourishing. Um, so the, the idea is like, we, we know we have these messy institutions. They, they don't always adapt in the way that we want. Um, how can AI play nice with them? Nice with existing institutions or augment them or, or help them to be more robust. And uh, so that's a big, you know, big question that I don't have an answer to. Um, and so when I face that kind of question, I often try to like, at least try to get smaller and try to find some place where maybe I get like a little bit of purchase. Um, and uh, so one place to start is recommender systems because they, they are a kind of technological system that really mediates a lot of the time we spend online, um, really have changed the character of our lives. If we think about it over the, you know, the past uh, decade or so. Um, and they don't seem to be going away. And so maybe if we could think about how we could align those with um, flourishing in some ways, then maybe that, at least that would give us um, some purchase. Okay. So recommender systems basically are systems that will recommend content to a user. Um, and a lot of times they're often guided by engagement or quantitative ratings, um, like what content will keep you on TikTok? What book are you likely to rate five stars? Um, but by now it's, it's probably, you know, a familiar argument that optimizing for engagement is, is kind of like, is reward hacking us often. Um, so we'll sit on and watch, I will sit and watch, uh, not TikTok anymore. I've uninstalled that, but, um, YouTube or, or Facebook can still kind of get me sometimes. And I don't, I regret the time that I spend there. And yet it's somehow, you know, a compelling escape for me. Um, and similarly, um, star ratings are interesting um, because while they they do they can have good properties, which is that you know if you're likely to rate a show as a five, you will likely enjoy it. But they also kind of flatten content to a single number. Um, and I think one of the interesting wrinkles for me in recommender systems is how content can change your preferences and beliefs. Um, and so this kind of, in other words. Um, if we had kind of social societal systems that would kind of teach you things or give you lessons or whatever, there often be thought behind the behind that content, how it might change your preferences and beliefs, how educational systems, for example, like align you. Um, and if we outsource a lot of this media recommendation stuff to a um, like a star or just a rating driven system, um, that thought is is kind of lessened, and it's possible that um, you know people talk about YouTube having kind of radicalization kind of wormholes, where you you watch one video, another video, and all of a sudden you're you know um, joining Al Qaeda. Um, and, and so like uh, there's that's a kind of extreme example, but in also in, in other ways, just like the ideal the ideologies that seem to spread through social media can be a little bit um, out of whack. And star ratings also just um, flattened that different content that you can engage with can have really diverse impacts on you psychologically. And some of those be more or less appropriate to you in your particular context. So um, so the the kind of the research question that drives uh, this, this micro domain that I'll talk about is could we have a recommender system that could be guided in ideally a personalized and data-driven way by the qualitative impact of content? When I say qualitative impact, like I mean like things that would maybe um, Aligned with dimensions of PERMA that I talked about earlier, this this kind of model of well-being that's that's kind of like um, not perfect, but maybe okay. So can I recommend you a book that would make you feel feel positive emotions? Can I recommend a book that would help you to feel like it was challenging in the ways that were um, meaningful for you to kind of surmount as you read through it, uh, and so on. And so I'm not saying that book recommendations is like the you know the end-all be-all, but it's just like a nice little micro domain where I could find a data set that would would kind of um, be useful to work on. In particular, there's a scrape of Goodreads, which if you're not familiar, is a kind of um, collection of book ratings and reviews and comments and things like that. Um, and it's nice because books are kind of like tractable unit of content. Like a, a, you can recommend a book to someone and it might actually change their life, which is pretty crazy. Um, so it's big enough and kind of to have that impact, but small enough that you can read multiple, you know, many, many books across your lifetime and that this kind of data could be easily gathered. Um, 
So the subset of this data set I worked with had about 6 million text reviews, um, 24,000 books, and around 900,000 um, trajectories of users. So you get a sequence of books that would uh, read over time. And some of them, nearly all of them would have like star ratings, and some of them would have text reviews. Um, and so what I found interesting about this data set is that um, latent in these text reviews that people write about books often is qualitative information about how the book impacted them. Um, like they might write like this book changed my life. And with language models, we can actually extract different kind of qualitative lenses and then use that um, in a kind of recommendation engine that could be uh, more aligned to trying to find books that would, you would say, changed your life. Um, another interesting bit to me um, is that latent in these trajectories of books is information about people's dynamic preferences. Um, in other words, that you can read a book and it will actually change your preferences for future books sometimes, um, which makes sense. Like maybe you didn't realize you liked um, supernatural romance novels or something. You read one and then now you're like on that track. Um, or a book might actually change your philosophy of life. And then you might, you know, suddenly, um, you know, want to be into, into effective altruism or into AI safety. Um, and so um, this part of the project I haven't gotten to, but it's just be fun to analyze this kind of information to be able to extract it in a data-driven way and, and to understand um, more about the indirect impact that a system can have on you, like a, like a piece of content, for example. So are there books that set people off on a on a garden path, like they, you don't, it, a system recommends a book to you and you don't know that it's actually going to lead you to a place from where you presently stand, you would really not want to be. Um, and so um, I hope eventually to, to analyze that. Uh, but where I am right now is, is not there. Um, the, the first thing I have um, is just a static ranking of books on one dimension of qualitative impact. So there's like a, a blog post that I, I posted on this, which is kind of like a fun way to keep myself motivated more or less in the grips of a larger project um, is that could we identify books that that people <laughs> after reading them are likely to say that it changed their life so whether it actually changes their life we don't know but they say it does um, and the, 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 the approach is pretty simple so um, you can use like an embedding model to um, embed the different sentences of a book review uh, then train a classifier on top of uh, those sentences, uh, uh, on top of an individual sentence to see if like the, it, it encodes the sentiment that this book changed my life. Um, and then you could say, you know, across a book and all 10,000 reviews, like what's the probability that a person reading this book would say that it changed their life? And you get a list of lots of self-help books and um, novels and sci-fi and stuff like that. Um, and so it's interesting that you can do this, which I think is a, is a nice proof of concept. Um, and just for fun, uh, this is the, the authors of the most books on the, the life-changing list. Um, and it's Ayn Rand is there with Mitch Albom, John Green, and Brene Brown, um, which I think I think really would be like an interesting dinner party. Uh, I don't know how well that would go. Um, and a random aside, just because I uh, just, when you play around these data sets, you just find all sorts of kind of cool things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm about 40. And so when I, when I grew up, I was reading Calvin and Hobbes a lot. And the, the absolutely highest rated in terms of stars book on Goodreads as of 2017 is, is the complete Calvin and Hobbes, um, which is like all the Calvin and Hobbes books. And um, this also illustrates a problem with the data set, which is that there's a selection effect here. Like Calvin and Hobbes is good, but who's the book, who's the people who are going to by the complete Calvin and Hobbes is the people that really have read Calvin and Hobbes before and liked it. And so this is gonna, you know, uh, crystallize only the true believers into a really high rated book. Um, and so the ongoing work is to train transformers on Goodreads instead to make this some more personalized data different recommendation system. Um, so how would you get around this Calvin and Hobbes problem? So if you don't like Calvin and Hobbes, you know, that's uh, this, crystallized version of the true believers of, of Calvin Hobbes. If someone recommended that to you, it's not gonna work for you. Um, so instead you can um, personalize it by um, inputting first a couple of books that you, you've you read and then having something that taken into account that context could predict, for example, um, given you've read these books, the book that you're most likely to say changed your life after reading it is X. Um, and you can do this not just for changing your life, but for things like related more directly to Perma, like 
what book could give you positive emotions, a sense of flow, a sense of meaningful challenge. Um, so this is, I've, I've trained some transformers. The results aren't exactly perfect yet, um, but uh, I think it's at least given me some intuitions and a little bit of a purchase on this problem, um, but um, I'm not really sure where it's going. Um, and so zooming out, yeah, Goodreads is just a place to build intuitions and take some baby steps. Steps Plus, I, I, just, I really like books. I think they're really fascinating. Um, it's like wild that you can buy like a $10 thing and it could potentially yeah, change the course of your life. Um, so a lot of deeper unaddressed questions, you know, from the, you know, the initial high philosophy I talked about, I really haven't cashed out how we solve any of those problems. Um, so we think of like a book recommendation engine. Um, a lot of the time we're just thinking about the individual aspects of it. Like how is it, you know, person says it changes their life, but of course there's societal implications for a book recommendation engine as well, in the sense that, um, you know, what are the effects of, well, if you started recommending at scale, everyone should read Ayn Rand, um, for example, um, what kind of society would result from higher adoption of that? There's all these sorts of downscale effects and those could be good or bad. Um, so how do you balance those two things, which is something that institutions generally try to do? Um, and more broadly, beyond just recommendation systems, um, how do we design AI systems at large that augment, replace, support, um, help ex existing institutions adapt? So there's excitement, for example, around um, deliberative democracy that is kind of augmented by language models um, from like the Collective Intelligence Project and uh, the AI Objectives Institute, um, which would be another way of trying to support a particular institution, make it better, just given how core um, democracy is to, to our country. Or things like AI tutors, could they embody better ideals of education and current systems and so on? And then even on the, on the broadest level, um, um, when I talked about how these, like, we want our institutions to kind of hang together, um, uh, what, what is our societal vision for that? Like, I mean, I just kind of was, I mean, there's probably like literature on this that I haven't yet found about how people think about how institutions should fit together uh, to support flourishing. Cause it seems like that's, you know, one motivation for why they exist. Um, but going forward, what do we want that to look like? Um, what's a positive future that we could have? We, AI may require us to kind of, um, to reimagine some of this stuff just because, well, for many reasons, but one being that with all this optimization power, the misalignment problem in my mind could get a lot worse. Um, and if capitalism gets, gets really, really good at hacking us and like, I'm on TikTok like 23 hours a day, like, oh, I won't be happy with that. Well, I guess I would, I would do it probably, but I wouldn't be, um, probably living my best life. Um, so, uh, to conclude, um, AI progress, even if not super intelligence still can cause bad stuff. Um, I think it's an interesting perspective to think of alignment as an ongoing open-ended process. Uh, I, in my mind, it might be that that is the way it has to be. Um, I'm not really sure about that. Um, and then arguably kind of human and institutional misalignment is in my mind, the driving cause of AI risk, like that we just aren't behaving wisely and why is that? Um, well, we didn't really evolve for this and our institutions didn't either. Um, so the challenge that I'm interested in is how can AI help reduce this kind of misalignment? And just as a proscript, um, uh, a lot of the view here is kind of related to what you call like meta-modern philosophy. There's kind of a controversial author, author named Ponzi Freinacht uh, who wrote a book called The Listening Society in a Sequel. Um, and whether you agree with it or disagree with it, I think it's it's an it's an interesting and challenging point of view um, as a way of kind of bridging this kind of gap sometimes that I see between uh, the AI safety and kind of AI ethics kinds of communities, where I feel like they're kind of both sides of a um, what's the word dialectic kind of tension, and there's something that might kind of unify it. Um, and so this kind of institutional view and kind of human growth and flourishing is it's kind of a lot of uh, things that are talked about in metamodernism. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, this might be a dumb question because I'm not an ML engineer, but when you talked about uh, tokenized, or when you talked about the uh, the the project i think you said there was like a separate token for each book yeah that sounds like more distinct tokens than i would have expected is that does the number of books end up being a good fit for like what's a good number of distinct tokens 
Yeah. Um, so this is a, a transformer trained from scratch with a lot of affordance on you know the, the system of uh, how you assign tokens. And so like nothing in this system is is, is kind of plain text. Um, but actually, yeah, 24,000 different kinds of tokens, I think, isn't um, isn't extremely large for sure. Um, especially for like larger models have like larger vocabularies. Um, actually, I'm not an expert in tokenization, so I could be doing something a little bit naive, but it seemed like there was enough data um, um, to that the token embeddings kind of made sense. So I, I should have included one of these, you know, kind of cool TSNI plots where, um, you know, the different kinds of books actually are kind of separated by looking at the token embeddings of the different books. Like the romance novels are all here and like the philosophy ones are over there. Um, so it seems like it's kind of working, um, but I, the arcane art of tokenization is not something that I'm a super expert on. So if anyone had any uh, advice, that's that's fine. And one thing I didn't mention is that um, it's kind of a hack. There's probably better ways of doing this eventually. But um, right now, I'm also creating special tokens for different kinds of qualitative properties, like that are that a text review might have. So like if a if there's like a a text review that I have a classifier that says it changed a person's life. And I would in inject this special life-changing token or like the positive token that they really liked it or like this book gave me a sense of flow token, which is kind of janky because ideally you'd, you'd want everything to, um, you'd want to actually just put like the, the actual review text in there or summary of the review or something, but I, I'm operating on a budget, so. Thanks. Why aren't you just fine tuning LLMs to do this recommendation? When like they already have all this knowledge of language, they will understand the reviews perfectly. Right, right. So one is, um, first of all, it would be just useful just to do it even without any fine tuning. They probably would do a decent job. Um, and it would be embarrassing if they just did a better job than, than my uh, actual. Yeah, yeah. possible. It's, it's, it's possible. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think at least I have this hypothesis that um, the kinds of data that an LLM is, is trained on, it would rarely see these kinds of sequences of books and reviews in a way that I still think the, the system design might perform a little bit better. But I do think that, yeah, fine tuning language models on this would be a would be a, a great route. And even interestingly, you know, with long context language models, you could actually put the text of some of the books in there and and, and try to create like a, you know, a, um, uh, a book to review probabilistic map, which would be really fun. Um, I think basically it's just been kind of like, I don't want to dump a lot of money into it. <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, at least like like the fine tuning APIs that you would have access to, um, it seems that they kind of, and I could be wrong about this, they, they kind of, there's not that many parameters that you, you have access to kind of like, they're like Laura style things. Oh. And so like it might top out kind of quickly, but it'd still be worth trying. Um, yeah, like Mistral, yeah. Mistral or something. Yeah, yeah, right. So like actually setting up like a fine tuning pipeline where you could do that, um, I think would be a good idea. Um, yeah, so I think that would be a, a very reasonable thing to do. And especially, again, I mean, the, what, how large the context window is and how you can fill this stuff in there, it seems like it probably should fit. Um, but that would definitely be a, um, um, a system that probably would work uh, better than this one. We have one question from the chat. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks for the talk. I generally agree that we want better epistemic tooling. Um, I think one question here is, um, it is I find it interesting that you're focused on books. I guess to me, books seem kind of antiquated. Um, they have all this information that I don't want that much, um, as opposed to finding the main insights from the book that could be like phrased in a specific way, at which case it's kind of like, can we just optimize um, language models? To tell us information that's like the best, you know, the most life changing information, as opposed to recommending that we send someone to this big book that's not going to be as optimized. So, curious, like, why you're so focused on books? And, like, are there other things um, in this middle ground that maybe steps forward after this? Or, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, partly is, I, just, I really like books. So I am kind of antiquated yeah. in that notion. Um, uh, so yeah, it's kind of a romantic notion, but, but also it, it's, um, this is only intended as kind of like a micro domain. So it, it's, it could lead to something that's interesting or useful maybe. Um, but I agree ultimately, yeah, books are not the, um, are not the endpoints. And if you had ideas of kind of domains where this kind of data is already available. So like the, one of the challenges is 
I mean, so one thing I could do is to make a toy domain where I control, like I make artificial data that kind of um, highlights the kind of problem I care about. Um, but another would be um, like in the sense of what information do people encounter that changes their life? Um, where do you find archives of, of that? I mean, it could be that you actually could extract from reviews of books, that kind of information, or or just in general, um, look for people's blogs where they talk about this, um, like what kinds of ideas have changed people's lives. Um, but this is like a really nice kind of controlled setting where you get like sequences of books, like when they read them, like the review, you know, what they rated it, whether they, you know, whether they write a text review or not. So it's like a very kind of controlled environment where the data is just given to me. Um, but yeah, open to suggestions for like how to scale beyond books, which um, although I have an attachment to, I, I agree that they, they may be uh, on their way out. I guess most people would hate this, but tweets seem like a very obvious um, next step. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, tweets, tweets can be interesting. Yeah, I, it, it's in those more messier domains. It's like when you um, when someone tweets something and there's all these like likes and replies, it would be it would take some nuance to figure out like what replies are like just trolling and what replies actually, you know, entail that this person was really moved by this message or, or what the qualitative impact was. But yeah, tweets are an interesting idea. Uh, this is more a, a comment than a question, but just I uh, want to say we've, we've been doing a bunch of fine tuning of open source LLMs. So if you ever want to talk to anyone about that process, then feel free to drop me a line. Uh, cool. Yeah. I um, uh, who is who's speaking? I don't have like a. Uh, uh, this is Adam. Oh, Adam. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Adam. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we, we can chat about that. Yeah. Uh, can you say more about like in the limit? What does it mean to optimize for a qualitative thing? Because like you talk about optimizing for like flourishing, which you like operationalize as promo, but actually like the second word engagement is like the same word as what social media companies like use. They're like, oh, we optimize for engagement. <laughs> so then like, how is it different to like optimize for like, oh, like changing your life operationalized as like the metric of how many times someone says this book, like, like changed their life is like also a number. So is there a difference? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Uh, I guess like like just a minor point would be that, um, and this is just in the weeds, but uh, engagement to Seligman um, would be something like flow, which is Chick Mal. Well, I don't know how to say his name, but the, the idea of like there's like actually like a challenge in there. It's, it's like not just that you're kind of lost in something, but that it's actually like a meaningful challenge uh, that you're at the edge of your abilities or something in a really engaging way. Um, and so I would say that. Uh, you know, like TikTok isn't kind of optimizing for that that flavor of engagement, but your but your point more broadly is, is exactly right. Like like that um, that the way that uh, I am quantifying this quality of changing changing your life is like it's gameable in all sorts of ways. For example, like all the a lot of these books um, that people read that say they change their lives, well, did it actually change their lives? You know, like you might might read you know Brene Brown and feel like my life has changed, but maybe actually you know maybe it has. Um, but a lot of the top books in the list are kind of like um spiritual esoterica kind of and um some is like just pure pseudoscience like there's like stuff on like past life regression that's kind of like kind of high on the list which is like interesting that it changes people's lives um but seems um you know epistemically suspect um so th i think that's one of the reasons why you might say that um it's kind of like the, the idea of the process is really important like the open-ended process of alignment because um i think how we typically deal with these kinds of things is we try to, you know, be aware when we're good hearting a particular measure and, and try to broaden out like our definition of something. Um, and uh, yeah, PERMA itself is, is, is not the end all be all either. Um, we, there's many things we don't know about flourishing and we, we just keep debating it. Um, and maybe we always are a, a kind of a space of uncertainty as to like, what's the ultimate ground of human flourishing. Um, you know, people just might have different opinions about that. Um, so I think that the, the key is, yeah, how do you how do you keep reorienting dynamically towards the qualitative? Like um, some Zen koan about you know it's, there's the finger pointing at the moon and there's the moon and like we don't want to like just keep looking at the finger. Um, but it's hard. Yeah. Uh, Six M Mentali, I believe, um, is the name of the flow guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, oh, even better. <laughs> Yeah. Um so I noticed I noticed um like 
a lot of your views on like the social problem of alignment and like, um, you know, the, at, at the high level, like it didn't have a unique contribution from LLMs. Like you weren't saying that like LLMs are like a new social problem. Like you were saying like the, the kinds of like Rexis and attention economics kind of like stuff that would have been said like well before GPT-2, right? Um, and of course you use, you use tokenization, uh, not tokenization, you use um, the vectorizations, the embeddings from LLMs um, later on when you're doing low level stuff. But I wondered if you think that's accurate that like um, LLMs do not change the game necessarily in terms of like, you know, institutional alignment and that kind of high level stuff. Yeah, I think, I think um, LLMs and just foundation models in general do change the game. Like from one side, you could just say it's like just increasing optimization pressure that, that these systems are able to exert upon us. Um, but I feel like uh, there is a qualitative shift when you're able to generate like realistic video or something, for example, like and this, this information and properties of that in the way that we might be easily hacked, more easily hacked by like really convincing video of our, the enemy politician doing the bad thing um, or language models that previously would you know, take humans designing kind of arguments for how to, you know, convince you um, of a particular idea, but now you could have um, uh, with, with better language models, you can have like uh, personalized arguments that, you know, target your psychological weak points or something. If, if there's also like ocean profiles of you out in the web or something. Um, so I, I do think it, from one lens, it's just like, we're getting better at optimizing against against humans. Um, uh, and the other thing is that as we conquer more modalities of input and output, um, then I think there is there is a qualitative change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that clear of anything. <laughs> We've got time for one more question. So thanks for your talk. I thought it was really cool. And I like this idea of using recommendation systems as this like micro problem that we can actually solve to make alignment progress. Um, one thing I was kind of wondering though, is what is kind of the current state of the art here? So I feel like people have had some general understanding that just optimizing for engagement is bad for like almost a decade. And within companies like Facebook or YouTube or whatever, you know, not everyone there is like, purely evil profit motive. Some employees actually are idealists. And then within academia, there's like large communities and conferences just on this topic. So yeah, I'm kind of curious what, you have some sense of what is the current state of the art of non-engagement recommender systems and like what, how this kind of builds on that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... Yeah, I'm not intimately familiar with all parts of the literature, so there could be a lot of things that I'm missing. Um, but I guess my my broad sense is that there are definitely people at you know the big companies that try to work on these problems um, in some ways. Um, I think rarely with the kind of like human flourishing as the backstop kind of view, um, but more in sort of like a targeted kind of uh, what can we do to get in the way of political disinformation or um, hate speech or, you know, kinds of the, the things that they might have the biggest legal liabilities for. Um, in terms of the academic research, there's definitely, you know, interest in, I guess, from the broadest level, like how to make institutional forms of AI. So um, there's a lot of work on recommendation systems from Jonathan Strayer and Aviv, I can't remember his last name, um sorry oh yeah yeah it was in like interesting work like bridging systems which is like a way of trying to um combat uh really divisive speech and try to like find consensus um but i guess so far i haven't found a lot of, at the kind of like recommendation systems for like psychological flourishing um and it could be that i haven't looked in the right places um but i imagine you know just in general th there will be a lot of interest in uh, you know, how we steer these systems towards the saddle good. Thanks. Yeah, we're almost at time. Um, so thank you once again so much. Um, I've already said that you've written the books. So if you want to help Joel move on to the future. My book was not on the list. My book was not on the list. Change, change your life. <laughs> <laughs>
It's also a very good podcast with uh, Spencer Greenberg a while ago things on AI and love. Oh yeah, machine love, machine love. So another thing that I'd recommend um, to people here, and um, is there anything else that you would want people to know or where to find you if they have any questions? Um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me via email or Twitter. Um, I should have put my email on the slides, but um, yeah. It's... Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious to hear um, from you if, if there are any questions further into this. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much.